Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, Jeremy Corbyn has been giving a speech, setting out his views on defence and foreign policy. The Labour leader is a former chairman of the Stop the War Coalition, but today he's been explaining the circumstances in which he would countenance military action. In his speech, Jeremy Corbyn declared, I am not a pacifist. He argued that military force can be justified if it's used as a genuine last resort and in compliance with international law. He also took aim at the foreign policy of recent years. He said the war on terror has failed. And he said that the bomb first, talk later approach to security and defence has also failed. Jeremy Corbyn turned his guns on both Theresa May and Donald Trump. He said there will be no more hand-holding with Donald Trump if he becomes Prime Minister. And the UK will pursue an independent foreign policy. But the Conservatives have responded to Mr Corbyn's speech, saying that the Labour leader has spent a lifetime trying to disarm Britain. Well, Jeremy Corbyn has been giving his speech at the Chatham House think tank in central London. Let's take a look. War on terror has been driven, which has driven these interventions, has not succeeded. It has not increased our security at home. In fact, many would say just the opposite. It's caused destabilisation and devastation abroad, and last September, the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Select Committee published a report on the Libyan war, which David Cameron as Prime Minister promoted our intervention in. They concluded the intervention led to political and economic collapse, humanitarian and migrant crises, and fueled the rise of ISIS in Africa and across the Middle East. Jeremy Corbyn giving that speech. Well, we've been joined from Leeds by Jeremy Corbyn's Shadow Minister for Peace and Disarmament, Fabian Hamilton. Welcome to The Daily Politics, Fabian. Jeremy Corbyn said today that he will do everything necessary to protect this country. What does that mean? Well, that means not leaving the country defenceless. It means ensuring our armed forces are properly uh, supplied and properly armed. Uh, it means spending the 2% that we're committed to through the NATO treaty uh, on our armed services and on our defence. Um, defence of this country, defence of the realm, is safe with the Labour Party. It always has been, it always will be. But what about a strike against the leader of the so-called Islamic State? Jeremy Corbyn, as you know, was asked recently if he would authorise such a strike against the leader of ISIS if, if the British security forces got that intelligence, and he didn't answer the question. Would that be necessary in your mind to protect this country? Well, I think this is a theoretical situation. I think it's very hard to say until you're actually faced with the intelligence and with the facts. Uh, it's all very well saying, would you do this in these circumstances? Nobody knows what those circumstances are going to be, so I think it's an impossible question to answer, frankly. Well, except that if you are saying that you would do everything, a Labour government would do everything in its power to protect the UK and Britain, if a member of ISIS in Syria was actively planning a terrorist act on the streets of this country, would Prime Minister Corbyn or authorise a strike on that individual or not. It may be hypothetical, but it's well, not that unrealistic. Well, I can't, I can't possibly answer that question. But, Why not? But because I don't know what the circumstances will be or the intelligence would be. But what I'd say is I can't see why Jeremy Corbyn would react in any different way to any other Prime Minister, Labour or Conservative, given the threat to this country. So he would and do what David Cameron did in that situation? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yes, so a Prime Minister Corbyn would do the same as David Cameron did when he reported the drone strike, uh, which killed a high level of ISIS, person in ISIS. Um, he, he may well do, but I mean, why, why are we talking about these kind of theoretical issues? Which, and we, we have no idea what the circumstances may be, uh, or what the intelligence would show, or what the military advice would be given uh, to the Prime Minister of the day. Uh, but I can tell you that Jeremy Corbyn, along with Every other member of the Labour Party and every Labour MP holds the defence of the realm, the defence of this country, as a highest possible priority. Right. And we will do everything we can to defend the people of Great Britain. Because people want to know and want to be able to trust a future Labour yeah. government that well, they would they? that they right, that they mm. would do the sorts of things that people would consider necessary to yes. protect this country. Jeremy Corbyn also criticised what he called unilateral military action, which yeah. he said has become almost routine in recent years. So 
Explain to us, does that mean that a future Labour government would always need full UN backing for any military action? Well, I think it depends on the circumstances. We're, we're a member of NATO and we know that the NATO treaty means that an attack on one is an attack on all. So I wouldn't have thought if one of our members was attacked uh, and, and the treaty was invoked that we would then necessarily go to the United Nations. Depends on the circumstances, doesn't it? But the defence of this country is an absolute priority for any party that wants to hold power and any government that is elected to power. But if you're criticising unilateral military action, yeah. the sort of logic of that argument says that Britain wouldn't, right, maybe rightly or wrongly, but it wouldn't be prepared to take military action even if the UK was under threat in a unilateral way. And by leaving that unclear, doesn't that effectively give someone like Vladimir Putin a veto on the UK's no. foreign policy? No. Because no. given that Russia is a permanent member of the UN mm. Security Council, you know, Russia doesn't respect our veto in Syria or Ukraine or Georgia, for example, but are you saying that we should always respect theirs? No, look, we should not embark on the kind of adventurism that we've seen in the past. The kind of adventurism that Jeremy quite rightly says means dropping the bombs first and asking the questions later. Uh, a lot of innocent people have been killed as a result of some of these strikes and some of these uh, conflicts. And that's something we want to try and avoid. If we can see a conflict coming, we need to do everything we can through international fora, including the United Nations and NATO, to try and try and de-escalate that situation and stop the conflict happening in the first place. Do you think talking and using the vehicle of the UN has been successful in de-escalating the Syrian crisis? Well of, well, of course it hasn't, but the UN has a really important role there. The problem with the Syrian crisis is that it's become so fragmented, so complicated, that it's almost impossible now to pick it apart. But the only solution is going to be through the United Nations. I can't see any other solution it unless... Turkey, Iran, Russia uh, managed to find some conclusion uh, between Syria and, and the, uh, you know, the ISIL factions and the other um, it, warlords there. Except, as you say, you, you can only see the UN as a viable channel through which to direct foreign policy or any acts of uh, military intervention. But what about humanitarian intervention? You'll remember, for example, yeah. Tony Blair intervened to stop Slobodan Milosevic attacking Albanian civilians in Kosovo. That was without the backing of the United Nations. Would Jeremy Corbyn ever do that for humanitarian reasons? Yes, I think this country has a very good record in humanitarian interventions. And provide Parliament uh, is consulted and approves it, then I see no reason why we should not take those uh, interventions on if it's for pure humanitarian purposes, All to right. save lives. Right. Uh, we're very good at doing this, and I think we've shown an example to other countries in the world. Now, is Jeremy Corbyn saying today what he said in that speech at Chatham House, what he really personally thinks? Or is he saying what he feels he needs to say from a collective point of view for the Labour Party? Um, he obviously, it seems, has changed his mind regarding NATO and defence spending. Let's just have a listen to what he said a few years ago. Join every campaign, fight all the cuts, except those in the armed forces where we want to see a few more cuts taking place and no more nuclear weapons. NATO was founded in order to promote a Cold War with the Soviet Union. That resulted in the formation of the Warsaw Pact. Come the end of the Cold War in 1990, that should have been the time for NATO to shut up shop, give up, go home and go away. So does Jeremy Corbyn still think NATO should shut up shop and go away, as he said, well, at the end of August 2014? It's not well, that long ago. No, it isn't that long ago, but he wasn't leader of the Labour Party then. He's so, now the leader of a large political party that makes its decisions collectively. So has he changed his mind? That's what I'm trying to ask. Has he changed well, his mind or does he still hold that view, but he has been either forced or himself converted himself to thinking that that is not look, the right policy to represent the Labour Party. He, he, he may well have changed his mind or he may oh. well still the same, uh, hold the same views. What I'm saying is that... You don't know. No, of course I don't know. But what, what, is, what is very clear is that when you're the leader of a political party, you have to go along with the democratic decisions. You have to go along with the collective view. And the collective view is that we support NATO and we support remaining a member of NATO. And that is what Jeremy is promoting. And, you know, I, I have my particular views about disarmament or about nuclear weapons but I go along with the majority Parliament voted to renew Trident Jeremy and I both walked through the lobby saying we shouldn't but we accept that democratic decision right. and we will carry it out but there are some decisions that only a prime minister can make and if you are putting yourself forward to be a future prime minister your personal views are important because it goes to the very heart 
of your personal credibility when you're standing up in front of voters. 2014, three years ago, Jeremy Corbyn saying very passionately there that NATO should shut up shop and saying that the only cuts that he would support would be cuts to the armed forces, a direct contradiction of what you are saying in your manifesto. But, are, but I'm sorry, are we really saying that it was three years ago, but are we really saying that, that when somebody says something three years ago, they're not entitled to change their mind, given how very, very huge a change Jeremy's role uh, is now but he's held those views then. you would accept he's held those views yes, very yes. consistently for his yeah. whole life so in the last three years he's had a radical change of heart well well of course he has because he never had the prospect of being the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom um, and now that prospect is in view with a general election coming up in less than four weeks time so of course you've got to change your mind you've got to take a much broader view mm. of what your role now is although you and did say you weren't sure whether he changed his mind or whether he was just doing it for for the for the democratic will of the Labour Party Look, I suppose I, the question for people is will they believe what you're saying will people trust that if he became Prime Minister that he would hold to those policies in the manifesto or would he under a comprehensive defense strategic defense review try and go back to the policies that he actually believes Jeremy will go al Jeremy's a Democrat like all of us and he will go along with the democratic view of the Labour Party now of course there are decisions that are made in the in the uh, seclusion of 10 Downing Street but they're not made by the Prime Minister alone they're made with a whole lot of advisors that advise about the the common good about the defense of the realm about the important issues that a Prime Minister has to deal with and it seems to me that you, you, you're trying to personalize this into the persona and the well, character he wants of to Jeremy be Prime Minister. Well he wants to be, yes, prime, minister. be prime Minister I think that's <laughs> fair. Yeah, no, that, but that's that's fine but you have to accept that of course he's going to have a different view about how this country should be defended compared with when he was a backbencher and speaking for himself and his constituents alone. Uh, and that will be a very, very different point of view to that of a party leader who's aspiring to be Prime Minister of this country. Fabian Surely. Hamilton, thank you very much. Um, your reaction on that, that goes to the very heart of the matter, can people, do you think in your mind, trust Jeremy Corbyn and what he's saying today as Labour leader and as a future Prime Minister in this election campaign, or will they refer to the views that he has held over the last 30 years or so in Parliament? I think it's a very difficult line to hold, that one between what he's been saying very passionately for 30 years and the position that he has now been forced to adopt as he leads the political party. I think Fabian held that line quite well, but the public will rightly look at 30 years of stump speeches and, indeed, 30 years, decades of, of, of dubious association with people who have meant this country harm. One only has to think about his support, quite vocal support, for the bombs and the bullets of the IRA, uh, a time where he clearly felt that military action or armed action was justified in that conflict. So he can make a speech today, a month ahead of a general election, in which he seeks to reassure people that he, he does wish to protect the country. But if you've spent 30 years positioning yourself on the other side of that argument, then people will rightly question your sincerity. Do you think this is a difficult area for Jeremy Corbyn to appear authentic because he is a man who has always said, I stand by the principles that I have always held? I think it is difficult for him, but I think what he said today is that would actually be very popular. I mean, if it weren't him saying it, I think almost everything that he said people would agree with. They don't want to be close to Trump. They don't trust him. They don't want any more involvement with the Middle East. They do regard it as having been an almost unmitigated disaster. They don't see any solutions in Syria or any particular reason why us adding a few bombs is going to solve that intractable problem. Unfortunately, because of his backstory, because of the clips you showed, people won't trust it coming from him. I mean, it's rather like Labour's manifesto, really popular things, and nothing in there that would be unpopular. Right, and just briefly, before we go on to the uh, front pages of the, the papers today, I mean, do we know anything more really about Theresa May's foreign policy? I mean, as Polly Toynbee said, you know, cuddling up, if that's how people might view it, to Donald Trump will not be a popular image for a lot of British voters. No, I mean, my personal view is that the, the special relationship is special because it endures and it matters regardless of who is in office on either side of the Atlantic. Well. Um, so I, I don't think that Theresa May was wrong to go to Washington. I think perhaps you might regret the fact that President Trump grabbed her hand and Corbyn can now refer to that in a stump speech. But um, I would imagine but, that there are Tory cheers yeah. when Jeremy Corbyn says that he will talk about defence policy in the election campaign. Yeah, although they know former, that... former military leaders have criticised Theresa May for saying that actually this claim of 2% uh, of GDP being spent on our defences is actually just accounting deceit. 
There is a row going on, which is much more important, actually, than what Jeremy Corbyn... Because we all know what Jeremy Corbyn thinks about defence. It's the one thing everybody knows about him, whichever side of the argument they're on. But there's a big row going on between, between Hammond and May about defence spending. The, de the Ministry of Defence is overspending its budget massively. It has ordered stuff it can't afford to pay for. It's in real trouble. And they want a new strategic review. He says he doesn't want one because he knows that it will uncover the extent to which they're in bad trouble. Right, and that's a much more important story. Well, let's have a look at uh, how some of today's papers covered the leak of Labour's manifesto, Polly, which you talked about uh, briefly there. Christian's uh, newspaper City AM says, never mind the 70s, Corbyn will take us back to the 1940s, referring to the level of state intervention promised in the manifesto. Polly's paper, The Guardian, has a picture of Jeremy Corbyn on the front page and calls it a radical manifesto, which the Labour leader says will transform lives. The Times claims the manifesto has promoted an internal civil war within the party and it also has a picture of our colleague Giles Woolerton, the BBC cameraman whose foot was run over by Mr Corbyn's car yesterday. And The Sun also has a picture of Giles on its front page alongside a picture of Unite boss Len McCluskey taking a tumble down some steps. It looked quite painful. The headline is Crash Bang Wallies claiming that the manifesto launch is a shambles. I mean, in a way, Labour has a point about members or parts of the press who've just got it in for him, whatever he says. No, I don't think he does. I think it has to be reflected that, that, that most of the printed press in this country is sceptical, if not hostile, to some of the positions that he's advocating. But they would be whatever he said and whatever he did. They're, They're not prepared. 85% of the press is always against Labour. Always. Well, listen, if, the, the, the reference to the 1940s that was on our front page mm. was from Paul Johnson of the IFS. Nobody can accuse him of being always against Labour. That is one of the most impartial and respected institutes in the country. His observation is that the policies outlined in the manifesto, uh, Labour's manifesto, are so radical that they really would transform the role of the state in, in so many areas of people's lives and, and lead to such extraordinary levels of state spending that they really ought to be questioned. Um, and you, you say, Polly, that nothing in the manifesto would be unpopular. There are some things that are unpopular, but you're absolutely right that t time and again, whether it's on nationalising rail, banning fox hunting or zero house contracts, these things poll very, very well with the public. And yet, it is Mr Corbyn himself and the wider team around him that will prevent that, those policies. That's a very important difference implement. because it is not a, I mean, it is a popular manifesto. When people compare it with the 1983 longest suicide mm. notice... Well, it didn't, do, which it didn't do them any good then, it did it? It broke the Labour Party apart because it had really important things in it that aren't there now, like pulling out of Europe, pulling out of NATO, unilateral disarmament. They were deal-breakers within the Labour Party. There is nothing in this manifesto, I don't think, that anybody, you know, somewhat to the left of centre, couldn't agree with warmly. And quite what about the costings, the though? Well. Is, isn't well, we that the other way? Yet. No, we don't. It's coming that's, in the manifesto. But isn't that going to question. be the, the day of reckoning in if terms they, of the amount of money on social yeah. care, the amount of money abolishing tuition fees? I mean, these sound like very popular but very expensive policies. What we need to see is how they're going to be costed. We also need to see what the priorities are. Are some of these longer term things? Uh, are they really going to abolish all tuition fees even for the richest families? Uh, you know, will there be gradations? Uh, who knows? Uh, it is really important that those are watertight. Well, and they won't be because he's talking about spending taxes uh, on uh, the same tax rise uh, on multiple different projects. Um, we heard yesterday from the former Lib Dem pension minister, Steve Webb, who said that the, the commitment to cancel the rising of the state pension age would cost 300 billion over 20 years. But over know, 20 years, and and that's, a, that's, a, that's a bit of a chisel. Well, that's Mr Corbyn's going to have to try and be in power for 20 years if he wants to fully nationalise the rail because the last franchises won't come up for Well, indeed, that's a chisel. Years. People say he's going, to, he's going to seize back the rail. They fall back in mostly in about 15 years or so and they'll fall back in without any cost because they, you're, not, you're not snatching it back. The 1983 manifesto was all about uh, grabbing back huge industries with no compensation. This is well, well, there is well, there is that. quite a bit well, of that in, in, in the manifesto. The I mean, you know, although the Conservatives, of course, are, are wanting to to cap prices as well in terms of energy companies. But interestingly, the only bit of costing, apart from the respending, as the critics would say, of of corporation tax um, increases is this idea of taxing those who own, earn over £80,000 a bit more. 
a bit more. Why so modest from John McDonnell? I mean, we don't why, know how much why, more. Well, a mo he said it would only be a modest amount. That doesn't sound like it would be enough to meet those costs. Well, let's wait and see whether there's a mm. maybe there's a 50p tax for higher people. You could go up to 60p for the people earning, you know, a million and you could, more. But you would you, you could... would raise less money as a result of a tax rate that, that was That's set that high. That's not necessarily well, let's so. Let's save That's... this discussion for next week when we'll have the manifestos finally. Deal. Other news now, and Jeremy Corbyn says the war on terror isn't working, and Britain needs a fresh approach. In a speech outlining his foreign policy, he said he wasn't a pacifist, and he could see circumstances in which he would involve Britain in a war but he warned against what he called a bomb-first-talk-later approach. Mr Corbyn accused Theresa May of pandering to Donald Trump, who he said was making the world a more dangerous place. Here's our deputy political editor, John Pino. He's used to it now, all the attention, and not always friendly, though he still tries to be. Yeah, don't push each other, OK? Labour's campaign is so much about Jeremy Corbyn, his character, ideas he's held dear for 30 years, though some in his party wish he hadn't, like defence. And today, the Labour leader was holding to his oldest and deepest convictions, writing off years of Britain's way of war against international terror. The fact is that the war on terror has been driven, which has driven these interventions, has not succeeded. It has not increased our security at home. In fact, many would say just the opposite. But this, Britain's leader on side and alongside with Donald Trump, was not Jeremy Corbyn's answer. More talking, less fighting, yes, and a lot less cosiness with Washington if Labour wins. Britain deserves better than simply outsourcing our country's security and prosperity to the whims of the Trump White House. So no more hand-holding with Donald Trump. A Labour government will conduct a robust and independent foreign policy. The message when facing terrorism, time somehow to rely on peace and diplomacy. But what about Britain's nuclear deterrent? And Jeremy Corbyn's lifelong opposition to nuclear defence. For a potential prime minister, it's become a nagging question, a live election issue, and he knew it. I'm often asked if, if prime minister, I would order the use of nuclear weapons. It's an extraordinary question when you think about it. Would you order the indiscriminate killing of millions of people? Would you risk such contamination of the planet that no life could exist across large parts of the world? If circumstances arose where there was a real option, it would represent a complete and cataclysmic failure. It would mean world leaders had already triggered a spiral of catastrophe. That sounded like a no. He wanted nuclear defence reconsidered too. We cannot obviously decide what a review would decide, otherwise you would never review. And what do you say to supporters of British military power when it's not clear in what circumstances you would ever order forces into battle, in or out of NATO, and including strikes against Islamic State? I doubt many, if any, in this room would have questioned the legitimacy ultimately of the Second World War because of the catastrophe that had approached by the rise of the Nazis. But controversy today is about recent conflicts, British airstrikes on the so-called Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, which Jeremy Corbyn opposed. He's proud now that he joined the marches against the Iraq invasion in 2003, a war which drove down support for Labour in government. Today, he wanted British raids against IS reviewed. But examine what they're doing straight away, examine what their presence is straight away, but above all, that fits in to the whole point I'm saying, that I would do everything I possibly could in order to reignite the um, peace process. Some, not all Labour supporters, agree. Others, very far from it. A Labour party led by Jeremy Corbyn that would simply chuck away our ability to defend ourselves. And I think that is crazy and it's not the way I want to go. See uh, defence policy uh, sucking in billions of pounds uh, on Trident at a time when our conventional defence forces have seen cut after cut after cut. Approval for the leaders line here today, but Labour needs converts, lots of them. John Pienaar, BBC News. Now, Jeremy Corbyn has insisted he is no pacifist as he set out his view of Britain's role in the world, accusing Theresa May of pandering to Donald Trump. Mr Corbyn said he wouldn't follow a bomb-first, talk-later strategy. Theresa May hit back, declaring that the Labour leader was simply not up to the job of being Prime Minister as she campaigned in North East England. Meanwhile, our political correspondent, Michael Crick, was at the other end of the country where Boris Johnson was out on the trail in Newport, South Wales. He's 
back. Boris Johnson uncaged, mixing it out on the streets and so unlike Theresa May. Good morning, Mr. Johnson. They've let you out. They've let you out. What is this on day release? Where, where have you been? Where have you been? Where, where's the bus? The bus with the 350 million on the side. You're not. You're not stand by that anymore. Of course we did. Of course we did. You, st you stand by the 350 million. Yes. yes. How are you? Nice All to right. see you, sir. You can on you on the June the 8th. Oh, come on. He's a huge asset to the Tories, but a risk too. That may be why no nationwide reporters seem to have been invited to this event. We got a good tip. Can we count on your support on June the 8th? Yes. Thank you very much. While the Foreign Secretary was playing Newport Market, Labour's pop star was in London denouncing Donald Trump as a danger to the world and selling his foreign policy. The best defence for Britain is a government actively engaged in seeking political solutions to the world's problems. It doesn't make me a pacifist. I accept that military action under international law as a genuine last resort is in some circumstances necessary. But that is very far from the kind of unilateral wars and interventions that have become almost routine in recent times. Sorry. Do you agree with Jeremy Corbyn that Donald Trump is a danger to the world? Uh, I think that what Jeremy Corbyn is showing is the uh, continual uh, uh, immature anti-Americanism of so many of his uh, strain in the Labour Party. Now, I think, think Jeremy, he's a danger to the Jeremy, world? If Jeremy, if Jeremy Corbyn thinks that uh, the way to maximise uh, UK influence is to go around uh, weakening the alliance between the UK and, uh, and Washington, then he is uh, deluded. Now, in, in France, Macron took on the right. Here, your party, you and your party, have absorbed the right. Yeah. And, and, and UKIP are now joining you, standing aside in all Michael, sorts of places. We Haven't are, you become a very, very right-wing party? No, on the contrary, I think if you look at what Theresa May said today, and I, I'm... She made it absolutely clear that this is a, a different Conservative Party in the sense that we are now campaigning for absolutely everybody in this country. And I think she made You've it very, 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 very explicit that we are reaching out to people who have never, uh, proud, she said, proud Labour voters uh, who have been Labour for many, many years and many generations in their families. Indeed, as he passed, that point was exemplified by a row between Labour voters past and present. I've been Labour all my life. You don't can't be. I love. I'm voting this year. You're voting Conservative. Why is that? Because it means you're a disgrace. Of course you are. A Labour, a Labour man don't vote because he don't like the leader. He's going to vote Tory. You're a disgrace. I also voted for Brexit for the you. For you, Kip, as well. So, so, so that tells me you're, you're a racist man as well. I'm not racist at all. I just want to get the country back in order. What do you make of him, madam? Fine, fine. Fine. As long as he does what he says he's going to do, it'd be brilliant. So, do you expect then the three hundred and fifty million pounds a week on the health service as uh, was on the side of that bus in the referendum? Oh, that was a load of that, you know what. It was a load of you know what. Yeah. So you don't believe it? No. Well, that was Boris Johnson's bus, you know. I know, I know, but I don't believe we do that. You don't? No. It's thirty years since the Tories held either Newport seat. Newport West is one of about 30 seats where UKIP's not standing this time. And if the UKIP votes from 2015 all switch to the Tories, they'd be enough to win it. Michael Crick following Boris Johnson there. Well, I managed to speak to Jeremy Corbyn just after his speech, and I began by asking him when in the last half century has British-backed military action been, in his view, necessary? I think British-backed uh, action to enforce UN-agreed ceasefires, to intervene to try and bring about a settlement, to bring about, in some cases, changes, such as the Zimbabwean independence in 1981, such as uh, East Timor, when the UN brokered a ceasefire there, and some British forces were involved in that. I think that is a very good use of our armed forces capability. My objections have been where there's been unilateral action taken without international law backing, such as, obviously, the war in Iraq. But there's an appalling conflict unfolding before our eyes in Syria, and yet you oppose 
military action there, British involvement in military action. On whose, so if not sorry, then, if yeah. not there, when and well, where? When the proposal came for the bombing of Syria, the question was, on whose behalf are we bombing? But you still absolutely rule out any British I, involvement in military action in I Syria. I felt that military action would end up exacerbating, not improving the situation, and that's why we opposed it. It's not that we want the war to continue, quite the opposite. We want the war to stop. We don't want it to spiral out of control. If mili military action is very much a last resort, as you set out, it follows, doesn't it, that you would like to spend much less on defence? Not necessarily, because... That's what you said less than a year ago. You want to spend a uh, lot less on defence. Can I finish my answer? <laughs> Go for it. What I was pointing out, and I point out again today, is that uh, what you spend the money on is important. Our soldiers and our sailors and Air Force people have been actually shortchanged. Shortchanged with bad quality housing, shortchanged with the equipment they've got, but it's also what we spend our money doing. I think but the, you don't want to spend less anymore, just to be clear. Well, we're saying we would continue with the two percent, but it's also how it would be, well, how the forces would be used and deployed. Just to I clarify, that two percent is the NATO benchmark, and of course, NATO. Three years ago, you said NATO should shut up shop, go home, and go away. You have changed your mm. tune, no, haven't you? No, what I've said is that I want to use our position to try to defuse tensions with Russia and make um, uh, have us better relations across the peace. So would you send troops to defend a NATO ally with, who is under attack from Russia? Say? Well, Article 5 of the NATO Treaty says there is a duty to support any other nation state that is under threat. That doesn't necessarily mean sending troops, it means diplomatic, it means economic, it means sanctions, it means a whole range of things. So you'd do so, all you could to avoid so sending troops? I think you troops. have to look through the whole process because uh, relations between Turkey and its neighbouring states are not good. Turkey is a NATO member state. Would we automatically want to get involved in a war that had been provoked by somebody's actions? I think you have to nuance it and think it through. So you can't sit here and commit troops under Article 5 to protect an ally under attack? That's a very unfair way of characterising what I just said. I said you had to think through the entire issue. You had to think through the tensions that are there. Don't let's think all the time about how to go to war. Let's think instead about how to prevent wars by providing real security, real democracy and real respect for human rights for people. You said in your speech, and I quote, uh, you would want to do everything necessary to protect the safety and security of our country. Of Are you ruling out ordering a nuclear strike as Prime Minister Corbyn? What I've said was a nuclear strike by anybody would obliterate millions of people and there would be no first use of nuclear weapons. I want to pursue what the Labour government in 1960 started, which was the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We have to work with all the other declared nuclear weapon states as well as others to bring about a ultimately a nuclear free world. Can I take from what you've just said that you are still a member of the campaign for nuclear disarmament? I have been a member of it all my life. And you'll continue, <coughs> I, mean, I just find it puzzling that you know in the manifesto that, that has leaked that uh, uh, you've you're, committed you're working to... working for the leaked document are you? Okay, but you're, you've committed to keeping Trident. I assume that's still in the manifesto. Voted, I just wondered how hard... It was voted on at Labour Party conference. But is by that hard for you personally? My, by our movement, our party. I want to see a nuclear-free world, and I will do everything I can to work through the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and point out to people the horrors of what a nuclear war means. Listen, so it must be we have a responsibility, all of us, to bring about a peaceful world. That is my priority. Do you want to win this election? Yes, and it's going... Very well indeed. The numbers of people coming out on the streets to help us, to help the Labour cause, is phenomenal. Take us on a, a bit of a journey. What is it going to feel like if you walk over the steps of number 10? What will that feel like to you? Very exciting because we have a responsibility to do something about poverty, about division and about lost opportunity in our society. A government that changes the whole economic and social narrative in Britain. Very, very exciting. Not a tiny bit of you wants to be tending your allotment rather than sitting in the cabinet, around the cabinet table at number 10? It's possible to do both because if you grow plants and look after your garden, it gives you time to think, 
gives you a connection with the natural world and makes you stronger in so, everything else you do. So you wouldn't be giving up the allotment? How could I? Jeremy Corbyn, thank you very much. Now, two years ago, Jeremy Corbyn was 200 to one outsider in the Labour leadership contest. Mm -hmm. He defied those odds to win. Now he's in another race to be the next Prime Minister, and many say the odds are stacked against him again. According to his devoted supporters, his idealism is exactly what the country needs. But to his detractors, he's made Labour simply unelectable. So what motivates him and what's the future of the Corbyn project? Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, reports. Few British politicians get to hear their names turned into a chant. For his supporters, Jeremy Corbyn represents hope, the triumph of the principled and the mild-mannered. If you were going to be stuck on a desert island for the rest of your life, Jeremy would be an ideal person to be with. You would not have a lot of tensions or anything like that. Jeremy never gets yourself excited, never will. He just carries on. And that's the way, that's the way it's always been. It's been very easy-pleasy. To his supporters, he's a challenge to buttoned up mainstream politics and all its evils. They love the accidental nature of his leadership. It's the first time, so sorry in my lifetime, at the age of nearly 30, that something different has come along, a credible option has actually turned up. I'd rather someone who doesn't know where the camera is, to be honest, and actually says something genuine. Jeremy, you need to look at the cameras, please. Thank you very much for coming here today. To some, facing the supporters, not the cameras, goes to the heart of what's wrong with his leadership. You've got to remember that Jeremy Corbyn, when he became leader of the Labour Party, accidentally fell into a field, politics, that he'd never worked in before. He'd worked in a related but different field called protest. And in protest, what you do is you gather a small band of people who already agree with you, you talk to them, and you discover that they agree with you. In politics, of course, you've got to try and persuade people to come over to you. And Corbyn had no real experience of doing that. Just win. <laughs> to long marches of the left, that's pure heresy. He chose politics. He went on a lot of protests, but so do most of us over our lives. But it's not protest or politics. Protest is a part of politics. It's very nice of you to waste three hours outside my house this morning. Goodbye. Jeremy Corbyn's politics are shaped by the North London constituency he's represented for 36 years. North Islington, where he boasts that 70 different languages are spoken. He says not going to university means he's more at ease with everyone. One shadow cabinet member says Jeremy Corbyn's capacity for small talk is endless. Yeah, my dad was an electrical engineer and um, he always said to me, he said, you stick with electricity, you'll always get a job. <laughs> Not now, Jeremy, it's bingo. <laughs> and the man no one thought would be a leader doesn't buy the traditional model of leadership. It's not my way to try and control the way people do things. I want people to come together, come together with ideas and come together in enthusiasm. He goes into a meeting and he says, I don't want to lead you, I want you to lead yeah. me. Yeah. An awful lot of punters out there would find that slightly baffling and a bit hippie-ish. Well, I think we've had leaders who have not listened to the people and it's resulted in some calamitous mistakes. I want us not just to be a Labour Party, a political movement that wants economic change, that wants social change, that wants housing, that wants railways, that wants all those things. It's also about the cultural imagination of people and unleashing that imagination and giving them the space for it. He's probably a Marxist in the sense that he takes the analysis, Marx's analysis of capital, capital he probably would still adhere to, but I very much doubt he would go with the sort of prophetic historical destiny parts of Marxism, where some of the entourage really would. They still believe in a biblical interpretation of Marxism, but I think Corbyn has moved to a more woolly idealism, um, a sort of rainbow coalition of the left uh, idea. He's quite a 60s child, where the Marxism gets mixed in with a whole load of other slightly unrealistic things. You didn't see excited rallies when Jeremy Corbyn campaigned in the EU referendum last summer. It was these low-key and infrequent outings that helped to trigger the uprising when 75% of Labour MPs voted no confidence in their leader. We got 66% of the Labour vote to vote for Remain. We should have got 75% and some of that was not 
I, I was just pleased that Jeremy had the intellectual flexibility to change the views he's had ever since the 70s and the first referendum to come out in favour. Um, and I'm convinced that he voted to remain and believed in remain in the end. I think some of the people working around him who we had the most difficulty with probably voted to leave. His head of strategy, Seamus Milne, and his long-standing political ally, John McDonnell, have shaped Jeremy Corbyn's leadership more than any others. Jeremy is me a mailed him. I mean, I, I heard a story... Mild-mannered. I heard, I heard a story where the, uh, the, the cat jumped up and scratched him. And he says, you naughty cat, what did you scratch me for? You know, I mean, that's sort of... Tried to rationalise you know, rationalise. I mean, what do you think John McDonnell would have done with the cat? He would have kicked the cat and was probably... <laughs> Someone described Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the opposition and said he's an idealist surrounded by ideologues. <laughs> I, Something to that? I, I think that's quite a good description. You're the ideologue, he's the idealist. <laughs> no, you can't split it that way. I'm, I, I have ideals as well. Yeah, but but look, that makes him quite a useful front man no, as well. Not, that's at, all. How not at all. Look, Jeremy's his own man. What he has is a deep set of beliefs. He's a principled person. Completely honest, absolutely decent, um, but... He listens to you a lot, doesn't we're he? We're friends, we listen to each other, but yeah, I tell but you... Yeah, but the suggestion is you pull no, leave us. That's rubbish, that's rubbish. And we can win! <laughs> the Corbyn election tour pulls crowds around the country. But if the voters don't follow suit, will the Corbyn project, moving the party to the left, only a year and a half old, survive him? The right doesn't want us left in the party at all. Go in, do your own thing, you know, get your own party. I, I've said that on several occasions. Uh, and Still a real possibility. That, that could be a real problem in, in the future, of course. It's, it, the other side of a general election defeat, it's a serious possibility. It's a possibility. That the right turns around and tells the left. Get out. Hop yes. it. Yes. Expels you. Yes. Start your own party. And they become a nice, beautiful centre party. Long more, even may take the Liberals on board. You know, the Labour and Liberal, or whatever they might want to call themselves. Uh, and, and the that, Jeremy that Corbyn might, moment will have been a brief one in history. It'll be a brief one because of the people of Britain will have turned down his policies. Some people might feel that this election's come at a moment when he's barely started <coughs> on his project in terms of entrenching mm -hmm. policy and changing the personnel. I think that, that's the problem. We, we were looking at I mean, this September, the Labour Party conference, would have had a debate about making all these changes. Um, and so if Jeremy wins, I should imagine the Labour conference will rubber stamp everything he wants. But if he doesn't, and the party loses badly, Jeremy Corbyn's closest allies are telling him to stay in the job, to dare the right to take him on. Any challenger, they say, would find like the last one, they have to bow to a permanent shift in party opinion. I'm no less principled, I'm no lesser a socialist than Jeremy. <laughs> You, you feel there's a developing consensus between well, the, the Corbyn leadership and the MPs? I think across the whole party. I can't see it. No, I know, but <laughs> because a lot you, of the... A lot did of they the not tell you what they're telling well, me? a lot of the debate... That's what I mean, a lot of the debate in the media is around personalities. But so when, you know what they're telling me? They're not happy with this leadership and they want to come back and monster it the moment the well, election some of them is gone. Well, I don't know right about that. But all I'm saying is this, is that you know, the media debates around the, the personalities Within the party, the constituency parties and right, the different structures of ours, the policy debate is consensual. Smile now. <laughs> Come to Uncle Jezza. <laughs> his team says he's enjoying himself right now. Zen, Monsieur Zen is fine and Monsieur Zen is in fine fettle. The accidental party leader will need all his reserves of Zen-like calm in four weeks' time. If the responsibilities of power fall to him, or if bitter Labour opponents try to overturn his project. Gibbon on Corbyn.